All right, welcome back uh, everybody. And I must say I thank our two ambassadors and the minister for getting us off to a good start this morning. I think they touched on some of the core issues that will um, come up during the course of uh, today. This next panel uh, focuses on the political and governance aspects of Angola since independence. And we're looking at issues of independence, peace, national unity, and development. And we have three excellent speakers to address uh, issues under this um, theme. Our speakers are Ambassador Francisco Jose da Cruz, Dr. Alexander Vines, and Mr. Adote Akwe, and I'll introduce uh, the three speakers in the order in which they will speak. They bring to this panel different perspectives. We have an official Angolan perspective, an international analyst perspective, and a human rights perspective. And between and amongst the three of them, we hope we'll get a real rich dialogue around the core issues in political uh, governance in um, Angola. So Ambassador Francisco Jose de Cruz is Director for the Americas at the Angolan Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He has held this position since his appointment in January 2014. Prior to this, he worked as a private sector executive, particularly in the oil and gas sector, where he served as a senior executive of a multinational in Angola. His previous positions include Director of the Office of Studies and Analysis at the Angolan Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Non-Executive Director of the Port of Lobito Company, Deputy Chief of Mission at the Angolan Embassy in Washington, D.C., Executive Director of the U.S. Angola Chamber of Commerce, and Vice President of Communications for BP Angola. Ambassador de Cruz, welcome. Our second speaker will be Dr. Alexander Vines, who is the Director of Regional Studies and International Security at Chatham House, as well as Founder and Head of the Africa Program and Director of the Area Studies and International Law Program. Prior to these positions, Dr. Vines chaired the UN Panel of Experts on Côte d'Ivoire from 2005 to 2007, and he was also a member of the UN Panel of Experts on Liberia from 2001 to 2003. He has served as a UN election officer in Mozambique and Angola, served as a consultant for the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, and worked as a senior researcher on business and human rights for Human Rights Watch. Dr. Alex, welcome. Thank you. And then our third and final speaker, Mr. Adita Akwe, who is Managing Director of Government Relations at Amnesty International US. He rejoined Amnesty International USA in September 2010 after serving as a senior policy advisor for CARE USA. In this capacity, Adote has helped to develop and implement advocate, helped to develop and implement advocacy on CARE USA's priority issues towards the US government. Prior to his work at CARE, Adote worked with Amnesty International US, US for 11 years, first as a senior advocacy director for Africa, and then later as director for campaigns. From 1992 to 1994, he served as Africa Director for the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights, now Human Rights First. And prior to that, he served as a Research and Human Rights Director for the American Committee on Africa and the Africa Fund. We have asked each of our three speakers to address the following four questions from their different perspectives. First, how much progress has, has Angola made towards peace building, national unity, and inclusive government? And the three major questions that we've asked them to look at uh, what are the three biggest challenges facing Angola in this sphere? What are the top two priority recommendations for the Angolan government and Angolan citizens for addressing these issues? And what are your top two priority recommendations for how the United States can best engage and perhaps partner with Angola on these issues? And with that, Ambassador de Cruz, <coughs> the microphone is yours, sir. Dr. Mond Muyangwa, uh, thank you for your introduction. Uh, His Excellency George Chicot, Minister of External Affairs, and my boss, I cannot miss to recognize him. <laughs> His Excellency Rui Mangueira, my previous boss at the uh, Ministry of External Relations. When I rejoined the ministry, I was under his leadership that I started today Minister of Justice and Human Rights. His Excellency Agostinho Tavares, Angolan Ambassador to the U.S. His Excellency Ellen Lalim, U.S. Ambassador to Angola. His Excellency Ismael Martins, Angolan Ambassador to the U.N. 
His Excellency Janine Scott, President of U.S. Angola Chamber of Commerce, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to start by commending the Embassy of Angola to the U.S. and the Woodrow Wilson Center for organizing uh, this Angolan Day with the U.S. Angola Chamber of Commerce. For me, it's an honor and a privilege to be part of this discussion on the progress the challenges and advancements for Angola after 40 years of, of, of independence. My special thanks to all of you who have responded enthusiastically to the invitation to attend this event. Thank you for being here. Minister Chicot said the, some historical facts, mentioned some historical facts to set the context, so I'm not going to repeat that, only to say that Angola achieved its national independence on November 11, 1975, as a divided nation, in part influenced by the dynamics of the Cold War. During the first years of independence, the government had its main objectives to defend the national sovereignty, to preserve the territorial integ integrity, and to counter the Angolan opposing forces and the evading South African Army in the south of Angola. Since the outset, the Angolan leaders understood that in order to end the internal conflict and achieve national unity and reconciliation, the external factors and interference had to be eliminated. The signing of the New York Accords on December 22, 1988 at the United Nations headquarters in New York by representatives of Angola, Cuba, and South Africa, set the basis for independence of Namibia and ended the direct involvement of Cuban and South African forces in the Angolan conflict. It was created a new political and diplomatic atmosphere that was more conducive to peace in Angola. The road to peace and stability in Angola was long and strenuous. The wise and tested leadership of President José Eduardo Santos, who, against all the odds, took political risks and remained focused and committed to a pragmatic strategy, was instrumental in steering the country to a new era of unity and national reconciliation. Currently, Angola still faces challenges in consolidating peace, enhancing democracy, and preserving national unity and cohesion. We held the third multi-party elections on August 31st, 2012. The next elections are scheduled to take place in August 2017. Angola has been strengthening the democratic institution as well as enhancing governance through increasing efficiency in service delivery. On the other hand, the independence and the efficiency of the judiciary are improving with the capacity building to promote the rule of law and being tested with new challenges and opportunities under the watchdog of concerned citizens, the civil society and human rights activists. The government is also improving the quality efficiency and transparency of the public service management while enhancing the accountability and governance of the state affairs. We recognize that more needs to be done and will be done. Angola has emerged from more than four decades of internal conflict to become Africa's second largest oil exporter and its third largest economy. The war destroyed infrastructure, weakened its institutions, and brought the economy to a standstill. The current fall of the oil prices has created some constraints to Angola's budget and economic programs, which are critical to its development and long-term political and social stability. However, the government recognizes that it has to continue promoting competitiveness and sustainable development of the agriculture sector with emphasis 
on diversification of production, increase of productivity and production, particularly of food for domestic consumption. Such strategy is contributing to promoting public-private partnership in projects with particular emphasis on those related to the implementation of agro-industrial initiatives as well as job creation and combat to poverty and hunger. Angola faces several challenges of improving the quality of life of all Angolan citizens, promoting human development and a fair system of distribution of national income. In this context, implementation of education and health programs will remain key factors in providing basic conditions and opportunities, especially to young people and women, to realize their aspiration and combat poverty. The Angolan National Development Program for 2013-2017 is the country's road map to progress. Its implementation has been underway through requiring continued political commitment, support and assistance from international partners such as the United States. This blueprint to Angola's development requires more discussion with the U.S. private sectors to encourage participation in opportunities emerging in Angola and the decision-making process regarding where to invest. Distinguished guests, Angola and the U.S. has a long-standing relationship that goes back to August 1619 when the first Africans from Angola arrived at Point Comfort on James River in Virginia and became part of Jamestown settlement and the foundation of this country. Since U.S. recognized the Angolan government on May 19, 1993, we have established a strategic partnership based on friendship, strong cooperation, and mutual respect. During the peace process, U.S. played an important role as part of the mediation that led to the signing of the Lusaka Protocol in 1994 and commended the Angolan leadership and the high ground posture to the conflict resolution by inviting President José Eduardo Santos to the White House on December 8, 1995 for discussions on bilateral and regional issues. From the bilateral consultative commission set up in late 90s to enhance confidence and constructive dialogue, the relationship between the U.S. and Angola evolved in July 2010 to a strategic partnership, a diplomatic platform more in line with our common interest. This bilateral dialogue has been intense and productive, those needing to be taken to the highest level to create further opportunities for cooperation. Both countries, Angola has been a reliable U.S. partner in Sub-Saharan Africa, since both countries share common views and concerns on issues such as peace, security and development with regards to conflict prevention and resolution in Africa. In this context, in partnership with the U.S. and Italy, the Angolan government uh, hosted an international conference on maritime energy and security in October to address the challenges and threats emerging in the Atlantic Ocean, particularly in the Gulf of Guinea. Let me conclude by saying that Angola is a country on the move to sustain peace and comprehensive political, economic and social development. After dec decades of international conflict, we have achieved peace and stability through a national compromise and commitment. As people and a nation, in the last 13 years we have realized more than ever that an enhanced democratic system and rule of law, the diversity of political views and opinions is a sign of strength more than of a weakness. The Angolan government has been implementing with recognized success economic and fi financial reforms based on homegrown structural adjustment programs and policies to defend our strategic interest in an increasing globalized world. In the social front, we have been pursuing programs to make sure that each and every Angolan citizen benefit from the peace dividend and can realize his or her dreams and expectations in a highly dignified way. 
All these achievements have been made possible thanks to the strong, committed and passionate leadership of President José Eduardo Santos. Lastly, in an increasing turbulent world where even the basic principles of international law are being challenged in some quarters, Angola has always been a factor of peace, liberty and, and human dignity and play a constructive role in conflict prevention and resolution, particularly in Africa. Angolan diplomatic policies have been both an expression of how we pursue our strategic interest, particularly regarding the defense of our sovereignty and strengthening our national unity and our contribution to the international relations based on harmony and friendship among all peoples and nations. These diplomatic policies are also based on respect <coughs> of the dignity and the identity of each state of the United Nations. That, ladies and gentlemen, has been our approach and contribution as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council. Thank you for your attention. Dr. Vines, it's 10.51. <coughs> Your time starts now. I've got the alarm clock. All right. Here. <coughs> uh, look, all protocols please be observed. I, I, I'm, I'm very grateful to be here. It's really good to be back here at the Wilson Centre. I was here um, at the last Angola Day mm -hmm. conference and Steve MacDonald uh, was uh, heading the shop here at the time. And it was an important event too, so I'm really excited that there's another Angola Day. It's very, very important and very grateful uh, for you, the audience, being here. I'm going to talk in my short time about trends in Angola over 40 years. What do we learn from them and where are we going? Um, I'm no longer a young man on Angola. I started on Angola um, by being a UN uh, official preparing for elections in 1992. Dame Margaret Anstey was my boss and I was stationed in Melange province and it was life transforming because I'd never been to Angola before. I you know, didn't know much about Angola. I knew where it was. I spoke some Portuguese and I prepared for the elections in a municipality right in the north of the country bordering what was Zaire, now Democratic Republic of Congo, Masango. And on the election days in 92, people, Angolans, walked for three days to vote. They walked three days. <laughs> Nobody can convince me that Angolans don't want democracy and pluralism. They do. And it, as a young man, it, it humbled me because I realised how important democracy was and is for Angolans. It was the first time and I've never missed a vote since. And so it is important to bear that in mind when you hear about the discourse about what Angolans really want and cherish. So Angola has undergone dramatic economic and political changes since independence from Portugal in 1975 and uh, Ambassador Francisco José de Cruz has outlined some of them. But there continue to be major challenges today. An open democratic process is not fully established and the economy, as we're seeing with a commodity downturn, faces deep-rooted structural imbalances. The country's international relations are, un un are still ongoing major shifts and changes. We are still in a transitional era, in a sense. The US-Angola relationship has had its really strong moments. It's had its poor moments. It's improving at the moment, which is a very good thing. Um, one first part I want to emphasize is from the outset, from independence, the ruling Movimiento Popular de Libertad de Angola, MPLA, has faced many difficulties in asserting its authority. The legacy it inherited at independence was terrible. It was really difficult. Firstly, the Portuguese left with such rapidity that power and the systems of government were never systematically transferred, and the new Angolan leadership was not well prepared for the task of governing. Nothing prepared Angola for independence. It was a traumatic process, out of struggle. The second point is that the context, in that context, the new government immediately had to deal with the armed challenges to its authority, for many years backed by powerful foreign support. Angola, more than anywhere in Africa, suffered from the Cold War, with all the machinations and twists and turns of it. On the policy front, it set out initially to assert a Marxist-Leninist state that could overturn many critical aspects of the colonial legacy, fully understandable in that context. 
For in the absence of political stability and driven by a host of other factors, the MPLA has spent much of its time over the first 30 years of independence strengthening centralised control over the state. It was those legacies. So that instinct of centralising comes out of that history and needs to be understood. Since he came to power in 1979, President José Eduardo de Santos has amassed and retained vast power in the presidency, partly out of that historical experience. And, and I would argue at the expense of other arms of government. To me today, it's still clear that the presidency is too powerful and government ministries and other parts of the uh, Angolan uh, uh, state uh, are not strong enough. Nevertheless, one of the notable shifts occurred in 1990 with the abolition of official Marxist-Leninism and a move away from single party rule. So in terms of four key dates that I would like you to remember, clearly independence in 1975 is the first. The second is 1990 and that's about moving away from Marxism-Leninism. Look, that was partly about the end of the Cold War, the end of apartheid, but there's another factor that was taking place at that time, which is really important to figure. Low oil prices, low commodity prices. Some of the greatest moments of lasting reform, of transformation in Angola, happens in a low commodity cycle. I'm sorry, it's really easy to party and enjoy yourselves when there are high oil prices. You have to be more efficient, more accountable, uh, more effective in a low commodity environment, building a sustainable state. And so if you look at Angola's history over the last 40 years, the most major changes structurally that have taken place take place in low commodity cycles. Hence, it's a difficult, traumatic moment at the moment. We've heard about the problems of dollars and liquidity, but it's a major opportunity also. It's a really good chance to learn from the mistakes which the Honourable Minister has talked about and move forward. So, um, 1990 was one of those. The third important date that I think we all need to watershed moment is the end of the war in 2002. It is credit to the Angolan government that it ended the war. It had a government and national unity and reconciliation. Uh, it, um, the guns went silent and there's been peace. Angola is at peace. There isn't war in Angola. And I don't think there's any prospect of war anytime soon. That is a massive, massive uh, change in the Angolan history. No more war. So peace begins brings change, and it has been transformative. There have been openings and fits and starts, but it has brought change. One of the problems that the Angolan government now faces is that there's a new generation of young people. You've got one of the fastest growing populations in Africa, in Angola, many young people who don't remember the war. They don't remember my experience of 1992. When I was in Luanda and with a, 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 a young Angolan that I'd uh, hired to help kind of get me around Luanda, he didn't know the landmarks of Luanda from the Battle of, uh, of Luanda in 1992. From, you know, where Savimbi's house was to the Hotel Turismo and all these sorts of things. He had no idea. So that's all history now. It's not relevant. And so the discourse needs to change. Another key change is since uh, uh, the 92 elections, we've heard about two more elections. Democracies and elections do bring change. The last election was significant because the MPLA vote declined. They lost 16 seats. Another pass party, CASA, appeared, surprising us all in very short term getting extra seats. So it's the ebbs and flows of Angolan democracy, but there is change going on. And it's not totally dominated by the MPLA either. And new parties are emerging. And I think that's a trajectory we will see. Natural resources have throughout 40 years distorted the political economy. And every time there's been an economic downturn, there's the talk of diversification. But it's been talk often, more talk than action. And it goes back to my point about that this time there needs to be action and vision about how to truly diversify the Angolan economy. Because the reality is that even if oil prices go up again, oil companies are now possibly looking at Angola as a matured area with smaller amounts of oil that can be exploited, 
But the idea of the extension of the pre-salt and that there was going to be another boom era of oil is not necessarily the case. So Angolan policymakers need to consider that, that they cannot rely on another 30 years of boom oil. It may not be there. One thing that is also clear is that Angola, in history, in Africa, is probably one of the countries which the academics call has the most agency. Now, this is very frustrating to American ambassadors and others that they can't boss the Angolan government around as much as they would like. But it's true. Angolan agency is strong. And it frustrates Angola's partners at times. But it, gives, it is something that has been learnt out of armed struggle and is effective. That's not to say that we can't have a good open discussion with Angola. We can. And I have seen how discussion, often not through megaphone diplomacy, has actually seen long-term change in Angola. There was a terrible law on the books about internet governance, and, uh, which was withdrawn by the former minister, Kalish Fijon, for example, at the last moment. And I can give countless examples of where discussion, sometimes behind the scenes, sometimes in debates like here, have impact. Because at the end of the day, there is a common vision that there needs to be uh, a developmental good here. Finally, because I'm looking at my clock and it's 11.01. <coughs> All right. Um, <laughs> change is a long-term process. So change doesn't happen quickly. And really, in terms of change, it's only been the last 10 years that have been, a little more than 10 years, that have been a, 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 a process of change without war. Now, the next elections provides an opportunity because um, the old, Angola has to change and wean itself off its addiction to natural commodities, diversify its economy. And I personally don't think there's an excuse now not to diversify. With a growing urban population and a generation that doesn't remember the war, this is actually in the self-interest of Angola for its long-term prosperity and stability that that happens. And some of the changes are going to have to happen because it is a very centralized state, and it goes back to my point, with a strong presidency. Some of the changes will have to happen through the Angolan presidency. The Angolan presidency, when it decides to do things, does them very effectively. But um, at the moment, there is pulling in different directions. There doesn't seem to be, in the last mandate of the Angolan government, as much clear direction as in the past. And that's something I think that is lacking, particularly also about diversifying the economy. It's also something that I see with investors going into Angola at the moment. We're going to hear about the doing business uh, ranking. Uh, the last one ranked Angola really low, and we'll have a session this afternoon, 181 out of 189. That's not just about perception, it's about re reality. That um, there are too many bottlenecks and a number of individuals that dominate the economic landscape of Angola too much. This is something the Angolan presidency can sort out. President Dos Santos is a wise president. He's brought peace to Mozambique. One of his legacies, I would hope, is about diversifying the opportunities and the economy of Angola for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. I didn't even have to give you my dreaded two-minute warning, so oh we, we, we appreciate that. Aditi, the mic is yours to address a really critical issue and one that has dominated the headlines over the last few months. So over to you, my friend. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll, Alex, if you turn the mic. No, that's, that's <laughs> right. So thank you. Um, I'd like to um, uh, also uh, acknowledge all of the dignitaries in the room and, uh, and also all of the audience at uh, this incredibly important uh, gathering. Um, and I am going to, um, as, as I was directed, not only talk about the challenges, but also acknowledge um, the progress, because I think people expect us people from my sector um, to be um, the naysayers and the doomsday voices. Um, and in an effort to basically help both government as well as NGOs realize that we do have a common vision of Angola improving, as well as the relationship between the United States and Angola improving, they're, 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 we are not, um, quote unquote, antagonists. We are basically 
approaching things uh, differently from with different perspectives and hopefully towards an agenda where the people of Angola enjoy um, better rights, better economic development, better governance, and where the Angolan government also benefits from its relationship with the United States. In that, that frame of mind, I'd like to say that one of the most encouraging things is the dialogue that happened on Monday between the United States and Angola uh, that had human rights as a core discussion point. Um, uh, human rights tends to be something that is usually shunted off to the side of many government-to-government -government dialogues, um, but this one actually had civil society participation, unfortunately mostly outside of Angola, but um, one would hope that this would be the beginning of an opportunity where Angolan civil society could participate also, because in the end the stakeholders that really count are the Angolans, not uh, international organizations <coughs> like Amnesty International. <laughs> I'd also like to, well, uh, to echo what Alex uh, said was the relative peace and security that Angola has enjoyed since the end of the war. Um, uh, we all know that Africa is unfortunately dotted by much conflict in many places, and having a successful resolution um, to one of the bloodiest conflicts um, is no small feat, um, and ideally uh, does set the country on a path towards true development and progress. I'd also like to, to, to uh, reflect on the Angolan context or our attitude around LGBT rights and discrimination, which um, while on the books remains of concern um, because it is um, something that is uh, looked down upon and could be something that a person could be prosecuted on in practice it is a much, it, it, the, the, gun, the country has avoided the much more virulent, ho discriminatory, homophobic um, policies and practices that have happened in too many other African countries. Um, and I'd also like to um, acknowledge that um, while we have serious concerns with some of the eviction and housing policies of the Angolan government, this is one government that has actually constructed housing uh, for some of the people that it has displaced. There are clearly gaps in what is needed, but there is at least an acknowledgement that people can't just be kicked out from where they are stuck, so to speak, and left homeless um, without any prospect for shelter. So I, I do want to stress that um, we understand that this is a country that is only 14 years um, out of a very bloody civil war, um, and, uh, and prior to that it also had, um, uh, as Alex mentioned, and, and the ambassador, um, both uh, regional as well as international actors that were uh, in an armed effort to try to destabilize the country. But we are still left with the question of where we are at 40 years. And, 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 we, and it's important that we ask both the Angolans as well as ourselves whether we have achieved enough. Um, if you recall, if anyone who has studied African uh, independence history may remember many different African leaders from Nkrumah to Kenyatta to Nyerere um, basically being told you're not ready yet now is not the time oh, give us time you're going to be trained and their response was if not now when and 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 and, and why not now um, for human rights and approaching the protection of human rights can be discussed academically as something that takes time but that doesn't change the impact on the individuals who are caught up in human rights abuses. And so for those people, 14 years is more than enough time to see change. Um, when I was preparing some of the comments for, uh, I wanted to make today, I looked at one of the early S Department of State country reports on human rights practices from 1979. Agreed that it was a different political context, agreed that it was a different time, but there were, there were things that were eerily similar to the report that came out last year. Arbitrary detention, um, pre-trial detention, uh, use of charges um, without um, uh, adequate due process. Um, that's 40 years of, of behavior that has no doubt contributed to terrible human rights abuses as well as God knows what kind of intimidation that has silenced people from being active participants in the, in the Angolan society, whether in government or outside of government. The key human rights concerns I'd like to, 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 to talk about here as before I go into my recommendations are, of course, um, starting with civil space. Uh, civic space in Africa 
um, is shrinking. Governments are using legislation to regulate the work of NGOs. They are using legislation to to silence or to intimidate um, freedom of expression, uh, the independent media. Um, there are restrictions on association and assembly. Uh, Angola has not avoided those trends. And, and while there may be a different context to where it, uh, how it got to where it is now, the fact is that right now the country is seeing civil society space constricted and dialogue and discussion are not happening. Dialogue and discussion are essential for transparency. Transparency is essential for governance. There's a cascading effect that it would, we have to ask ourselves, can we not do better? Um, one of the, the, some of the, the more well-known cases, of course, are the, the case of the 15 activists that was mentioned earlier in a, in a question, and whether um, students discussing transparency and open government are indeed such a serious threat to a government. Um, it, it, is, it is the kind of thing that you see in, in countries where the word democracy doesn't go along with those kinds of behaviors. We should have a discussion about whether one can have discussions about transparency and good governance and, and, and whether it should be something to be um, afraid of. Two minutes, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we also have, um, as I've just mentioned, um, how important and, uh, diversification and investment are going to be to Angola's economy. Um, the, real, the, 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 the nature of investment now requires transparency and good governance and accountability. It doesn't just require access to the decision makers and the political actors. If you are not sure that your investment is going to be protected by transparent rules or you're not going to get fair bids and equally um, fair treatment, Angola is not going to be able to attract the investment that it wants and that it needs. Very specifically, on terms of recommendations in my last two minutes, I think the United States and the, uh, has to be a, str a strategic partner with the Angolan government in trying to promote this kind of, of transparency and governance, especially in the financial sector, if they are going to try to leverage the private sector and the global investment arms of the world. Um, I think we've also got to have the United States live up to its stated policy goals of promoting independent civil society organizations and, uh, and helping the Angolan government understand that these are not opponents, they are not political foes, they are partners in the agenda of development and progress for the country. I'll end very quickly by saying that when Amnesty was launched in 1961, we were launched around the arrest of Portuguese students toasting freedom. Um, it's ironic that here we are 40 years, um, uh, actually 60 years, um, and uh, we're we we here having a discussion <coughs> about what the future looks like for the country, and yet we're also still working on behalf of 15 students who are talking about governance and transparency. I would sincerely hope that discussions today would help us avoid having to look at these kinds of issues again in another 40 years. God forbid we're still here, um, but in another 10 years. In other words, hopefully by then we will be talking about the kinds of reforms that have happened that really do bring the best of Angola to the front and all in, in an inclusive manner. Thank you. Three very, very powerful uh, presentations that covered a broad range of issues and went directly to the core of the key issues that we want to discuss today. So, um, we have only, f how much time do we have? Who's keeping track of me? <laughs> Sorry, where's uh, Elizabeth? I I'll, I'll get to you in a second, sir. 40 minutes? Okay. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'll take three sets of questions at a time, and the protocol remains. Identify yourself, the speaker to whom, and, and the institution, if any, that you're affiliated with, and the speaker to whom you're addressing the question. Each of you has exactly 30 seconds. So it's one question or one comment, so we can get as many people into uh, the discussion as uh, we can for, for this dialogue. All right, so the floor is open. I'll, I'll take uh, the minister up front here. Sir, the microphone is yours. 
Thank you very much. I was not supposed to take the floor because I was invited to attend this meeting. You're always um, welcome. <laughs> by my colleague, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and I'm very happy to be here. And also, uh, I have to, to say something. I, once, uh, first of all, I want to congratulate all the speakers. All of them, they use their floor very eloquently. But I want also to clarify some things, especially uh, the last speaker. Uh, the last speaker was mentioned some uh, thing about the situation in, of human rights in Angola. And I want to clarify that. First of all, uh, we are improving. We are improving a lot. And uh, I have to say that uh, our laws and our institutions are changed. Um, we changed for the past three years the laws, uh, especially for preemptive det uh, detention. We changed uh, the laws, the penal code. We changed the laws on um, uh, money laundering. And those laws were changed in order to guarantee as much as possible the right of the citizens. And I advise you to consult the laws because they are new. And uh, we have so many guarantees for our citizens. Secondly, I have to say that uh, we have dialogue with civil society. I had so many meetings with civil society during my term as Minister of Justice and Human Rights. And uh, the last meeting we had on Friday before my departure to Washington, D.C. And we meet more than 30 NGOs in Angola. According to that, I have to say that there is no restrictions or the uh, restrictions of, or on freedom of the NGOs. We have, yes, to participate in uh, international uh, task force, uh, international financial task force, isn't it? Um, and Angola agree on 40 recommendations on that. We already finalize our obligations before that organization okay. in June 2015. We are under supervision and we hope in our meeting in February to agree on that. Okay. Secondly, based on that, we have obligations in terms of our financial system. We don't want some NGOs in Angola selling products in the market, avoiding taxation, avoiding the control of the market. NGOs are, in our point of view, to support the social work. And we have to have a control on what they are doing in our country. This is something that on Monday, I had a meeting with uh, international NGOs in Washington, D.C., we had a very fruitful dialogue. And we explained exactly what we want what, with that uh, um, NGO re uh, regulation, the new one, which is in force in Angola. Okay. Third. Mr. Minister, can I ask you to please? Okay. Yes. Just to conclude, the remarks regarding to the uh, 17 detainees that are on trial today, which started on Monday. I have to say that according to the accusation, they were not reading a book. It was not a meeting with students. This is not true. I have to say that uh, this is a group of people who are planning a situation of chaos in 
Luanda in, and in the other cities. Okay. This is the accusation that is in trial. The accusation that they were trying and preparing to put barricades on streets, burning tires on streets, and creating a situation that could create a big chaos inside the country. In no, uh, there is no any uh, communique from the Attorney General and uh, from the court that these people was reading a book and was sending to jail because of that. To finish that, I want to say that uh, the government is using the principle nulla crimis sine legge. It means that no one can be incriminated without a law. There is a law, and the law has been used for this situation, for the trial. They were in detention according to our principles, according to our time frames. And the time frame to wait for the trial is 240 days. And they have been accused in before 90 days. And after that, the judge has six months to convey the date of the trial. Less than 15 days, everything has been done. And this is something, this is according to our laws. All right, thank so you very much. So I think that is very important to clarify because there is so many information in social media. And the most important is to read also the official information about uh, that situation. Right. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. <laughs> Clearly, this is an issue in which there are very, very strong positions on both ends. Uh, we do appreciate you providing a little bit more information and context, but I'm, I'm sure uh, Amnesty and other groups as well are closely following and studying all of these issues. So we'll continue to have that discussion, but we appreciate your uh, input. Uh, I have a lot of people here, so I'll go to Malik and the gentleman in, in front of you. Just please keep it short so we can get as many perspectives as possible to make this a real dialogue. I think it's important that we be factual. When the trial started on Monday, there were diplomatic representations who attempted to attend the trial as observers. Uh, they were turned away. This is a trial similarly where there's wide public interest. It was held in a courtroom that only sat 70 people. Um, I believe in sunshine. I believe in openness. And because of the interests of people in Angola and people around the world in this trial, I think it would be important to, I would suggest a larger courtroom I would suggest that diplomats who, have, who are recognized and have relationships with the government should be able to be there as observers. Right, thank you. The gentleman right in front of you. Uh, I, so just a quick clarification. Um, I know some of the youth that were detained, they were indeed uh, detained when they w were reading John Sharp's book. Who are you? Florindo Shivukut from uh, Friends of Angola. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I, so they were detained when they were reading Jean Sharp book from Dictatorship to Democracy. I, um, and that's, those are the facts. Um, and I think it's important to highlight. Thank you. I think those are comments. I don't know, Adita, if you want to respond or anybody else on the panel, and then I'll go back to the group. I, I, I think, um, I, as I said yesterday, the, the uh, minister uh, was, uh, attended the, the dialogue with the human rights groups. There was a good exchange. Um, the, 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 the problem is, as Malik has just said, if you don't have transparency and obs in independent observers, there's going to be the space to disagree on what the government says is happened and what the rest of the world understands to have happened. And unfortunately, when that happens, the Angolan government is the one that suffers because there are questions on its credibility. Of course, unfortunately, the 15 students or the 17 students also suffer because they've been in detention. 
Um, without taking up too much time, I think there are some questions about the number of days that did take place before the, the judge was informed by the Attorney General of the charges. Um, but I think that, there's, there, that there, there are questions here. I, I, we can argue about the small facts, but the larger impression is, is the Angolan judiciary and the Angolan space for spe free speech being protected and respected? And I think that we can have a disagreement about that here, but we may not be able to have it in Angola. Yeah, right. Thank you. Alex? Yes, I mean, my, my, my view is it's, this is about transparency. I mean, I worked probably 15 years of my life as a human rights officer for Human Rights Watch on Angola during the Civil War and, and, and just afterwards. And um, transparency and disclosure and clarity, the one thing that has changed since the days that I worked on these sorts of things is the point we've heard about social media. So you suddenly have a lot of other conversations going on and information and perceptions that are quickly made that we didn't used to have. <coughs> and so transparency becomes even more important. I mean, myself, Club Kate said that I am a lobbyist of the Angolan government and the only person that's sensible in this whole conference is Adate. <laughs> now, do you believe that? Well, I'll leave that to you. But um, I don't mind their saying that. Uh, it's the first time in my life I've been called an Angolan government lobbyist, but that's Club K and, and the discussions that you get on Club K. But you do need to uh, have a counter-narrative and discuss and debate these things. And openness and transparency, as Adate has said, is the way. And what Malik has said, which is about uh, you know, access to the judicial uh, proceedings for observers. I think that's really important. There are some other human rights issues that I do think that could, you know, the Angolan government is doing good, some good things. The voluntary security principles, the U.S. has the chair of presidency of that for, for, for human rights and extractives. That's something that the Angolan government is moving towards thinking about maybe being part of. That would be a really good thing because I'm afraid one, one area of human rights abuses I fear will come back because it happens in low commodity downturn cycles is the violence and, uh, uh, in the Lundas ar around diamond mining. When the economy slows down, the lid of control on that gets lifted off. And so you may have your views about Raphael Marcus's book, you know, Blood Diamonds, but the background <laughs> to some of those things that go on there pop up when oil prices are low. And so the voluntary security principles, I think, is an important instrument that the Angolan government could be involved in to try and avoid some of that and learn from that history. Ambassador de Cruz, do you have anything to add to this particular debate or question? Well, I think the Minister of Justice was very clear in stating the, the government position, the fact as we see it from, uh, from the legal standpoint. As Minister Chicot said, uh, you know, let's wait for the judicial system to go through all the mechanisms and wait for the final verdict on this case. One thing for sure that, uh, you know, this is a government which has evolved from a struggle to uh, the affirmation of the, of the Angolan citizen. And that's why we stand up against the Portuguese colonialism. Human rights has been part of that struggle. And therefore, nothing can prevent, nothing can stop the evolution to a society where human rights will be more and more respected. And we are committed to that because it's part of our own um, system and our own way of governing the country. You may not agree with the, the evolution we, we have accomplished in the last 40 years, but uh, we need to see that in the context of the country which has been at peace for the last 13 years. Okay. One thing for sure, the commitment is there and nothing will stop and even if uh, in cases where you may criticize us, is not because it's part of a, a policy, maybe it's a shortcoming in the way we apply the law and we defend the citizens of the country. Okay. Thank you. Um, I did mention earlier on that this event was being uh, Twittered and we have people listening into the webcast. So I do have a question here from a Twitter question from Akela Lacey at the Pulitzer Center. And this is for Dr. Vines. Um, Coach, you are saying Angola is at peace. Uh, that was a comment you made in your remarks. The point is that 50,000 displaced from Gika and Chikala slums are isolated, 
without social services or jobs in Zango. Can you speak to this? <coughs> yeah, uh, it's a good question and this is about inclusive growth. Um, Angola has looked richer on paper but the disparities have dramatically grown and so the, 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 the question is how to get more inclusive long-term growth in Angola and that goes back to the issue of um, diversifying the economy. Um, oil doesn't employ lots of people and the Angolan government, I think, at the end of the war has done impressive um, investments in infrastructure. I mean, I would never have dreamt that I could drive all over Angola in the way I can now. It used to be 30 hours to a place that takes three hours to get to by car now. But that was the first stage. It's now about deepening the, the social net, providing opportunity, quality education. The easy part has already happened, which was the infrastructure. The challenges now are much more difficult, need more long-term strategic thought, more efficiency, more transparency, more accountability. These are issues that the Angolan government is going to have to get better at. They, it, it, there's already great improvements. It's not a war economy. But the next 10 years are going to be much harder than the last 10 years. And that's, I think, the watershed. So the final date that I have in mind, actually, of the four dates that I was giving you is 2015. I think this is a watershed year because I don't think oil prices are going to rebound quickly. Uh, and so a rethinking of how to reduce poverty and get inclusive growth without the easy oil money is one that the Angolan government really has to think deeply about for the next 10 years. I'll open it up to another round of questions, and I do have another question that I was given to ask early on that I'll go to. So the floor is open. Any more questions? Yes, sir. The gentleman right there. Thank you. <coughs> Nicholas Cook at the Congressional Research Service. So I have uh, one quick comment. I, I believe the pre new pre-detention law actually will increase the period of, of uh, detention without charges. Uh, and I'd, it'd be interesting if the minister could speak to that. And that also that the, the total pre-detention period is not a default 200 and some days. There's a process for increasing it over time. Um, my question is uh, for Alex Vines and uh, Ambassador José de Cruz. Um, what are the key, key things that the, the presidency, as Alexander Vines said, a need to happen for economic diversification to be durably uh, un undertaken. What are those kinds of actions that really need to take place to, to change the economy uh, away from and diversify away from oil? Thank you. All right, we'll take two more questions, if any. Otherwise, I'll ask my question. All right, we have a very shy group, this. Oh, you have someone there. Oh. Thank you very much. I, uh, uh, I would like to respond to the Minister of uh, Human Rights uh, uh, and Judicial Affairs from Angola. Well, it's a common occurrence by the government of Angola. Instead of producing facts or tangible evidence, they produce verbiage. If you look at what uh, uh, Mr. Hokud has presented in regards to uh, the detainees, he said they were reading a book. And if you listen to what he said, he just said the other charges. We would like to know what are these other charges. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? All right, there's a question I got earlier, and I'll put this out to all three speakers. Um, that they'd like to hear a little bit more about the leakage of resources through corruption and inefficient governance, and how this has impact how this has impacted development and human security in Angola. Could you please speak more to that issue? So, I will open it up to all three speakers. Maybe this time I'll start with the ambassador and work my way this way. Well, let me start with the the trial of the seventeen. Mm -hmm. This is taking place in Angola a sovereign country with a legal system operating fully. So this debate should take place in Angola, not here. Those who 
have taken a stand on this issue, were allowed to express their views, and the trial is open to the public. Those who have been there in time to enter the, the room have been allowed to do so. And therefore, uh, we see this as something important, for sure, but important to take place on the ground in Angola. And as the Minister Shikot has stated, let's wait to, for the legal system to take its, its course, and then we'll see and we'll have an opinion whether the trial has been, uh, has been fair. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, could I just interject? I'm, I'm sorry to yeah. do this to you. I, I think one of the pleas that I heard was, and this is where I think perhaps sometimes the disconnect could occur. Uh, I think the gentleman talked about the fact that the very small courtroom, first of all, this is a case that has um, you know, generated a lot of uh, interest and comment from around the world. And I think one of the uh, comments I heard from the gentleman was that the courtroom was too small. And I think what I heard him say was in the interest of the Angolan government, it also serves the Angolan government well, appearing to be open and transparent and in the interest of uh, ensuring that that move of having a small courtroom, given all the interest in the issues, that in the interest of having that small courtroom not be seen as a way of restricting space, that perhaps the Angolan government <coughs> could consider, even at this point, of, you know, at least a larger courtroom to start with that will begin to speak to some of the issues that were raised. So I just wanted to put that out that I heard a plea, a consideration, well, and so. And we have taken note of, uh, okay. you know, we have taken note of that. All right. And for sure that uh, the authorities will, you know, will d decide the best way forward on this. Okay. But we have taken note of that. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. No, if please, I can address please, the please. others. Uh, the, the disparity in, in the country. In, in 2013, uh, we had a, a national dialogue with the, the young people and the women to discuss uh, issues regarding to poverty, to social and economic development. Uh, it was important to listen to their views, to become part of uh, a comprehensive, and more pragmatic uh, government program on, on how to address these challenges. As far as the diversification of the economy, uh, the National Development Program for 2013-2017 uh, has laid out specific plans on how to move forward with the diversification of the economy. Um, you know, what needs to be done and what targets we need to accomplish. Uh, for sure that due to the fall of uh, oil prices, some of the targets will not be accomplished. But at least we have a blueprint leading us to the diversification of the economy. And more than in the past, uh, we are now uh, taking action and making sure that uh, we move in that direction. We have seen more and more uh, private sector investment in, in, the, in, the, in the agriculture and other sectors with the financing being provided by, by the government as a way of uh, moving forward with the country and avoiding uh, continue to have uh, a big share of uh, our resources being spent with, the, with the food imports and uh, other goods imports. So production, national production is very much part of the, the strategy, very much part of the everyday plan and actions of the government. Alex, I think there's a very specific question about some actions that the president needs to take. What are the concrete actions you would advise and recommend? Yeah. Um, it's about managing change and generational change. One of the notable things is that companies that are in Angola are talking about the pool of young people, trained Angolans that they have. They have some difficulty sourcing enough trained young Angolans, but they're also optimistic that there's a newer generation that are interconnected through social media, well-educated, globally competitive, and that is changing. The downside is that they talk about an older generation which didn't have those advantages, are not interconnected, don't have a global view in the same way. 
and also that there is a generation of within Angola, within the political class, that a stifling of pluralism, of entrepreneurialism, um, are uncomfortable with a brave new world that is pushing for change inside Angola and is happening. And so I think that's something that the presidency needs to uh, in the next couple of years and after the elections. I mean, one of the issues that remains always the question is, will President de Santos run for another term or not? Um, you know, how long is he going to be president, given that he's been president of the country since 1979? Whether he's president or not after 2017 is something that will, will become very clear next year, I think. But whatever the case is, it is about managing a change of guard, a generational shift that's really central, I think, now. If Angola isn't to lag behind some of its neighbors further south in southern Africa, there's an opportunity here. And tied to that, it goes back to what Adelte has been talking about, transparency, disclosure, uh, better centralized transparent processes for tendering, for example, of, of contracts. Because there's lots of inefficiencies between different government departments, all with their own uh, systems. Some of that's about inefficiency. Some of that might even be about corruption. And you've got to save money if the dollars are not coming in in the way they are. Angola can't afford to have the lazy old models. So this is why 2015 is such a watershed, I think, for the country. It is a moment about how to grasp the future. And um, I'm confident that there are brilliant brains in Angola. These things can be overcome, but it needs political bravery and vision and leadership. And that's, I think, reflects the question that we've just got that you've asked. Okay, thank you. Um, two, two thoughts. Um, I think um, it's important for uh, the Angolan government to understand that these are challenges that are familiar. Um, they have happened in other, other countries, in particular in countries where the ruling party has had to wage an armed struggle to come to power. And so these, these, are, these are not uniquely Angolan traits or, or, or flaws. Um, and, and the other half of that is that, as Alex said, it's a completely different context. The, it is an interconnected world. The, yeah. the, the flow of information now is much faster than any NGO or any government can control. And um, the key word I think you used, Alex, was lagging, beh lagging behind. Um, as you, at 40 years, as you look forward, where does Angola want to be and how are they going to get there? And increasingly, there are benchmarks that people are using, both for investment, but also as, as, as leadership, um, political leadership in, in, in the region and globally. And while the, the government is playing a large role in many fronts, in particular on, on, in its contribution on peacekeeping initiatives, as well as being involved in mediation efforts, there are other bigger questions that are, help, are, are contributing to potentially lagging behind in, in where Angola would like to be. So that's, that's I think, one thing I, I, I would like to, 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 to sort of speak to. Um, the, um, I think that the other, um, in terms of the in, um, transparency issue, um, which is for a, a group like mine, basically linked to the rule of law and the independence of the judiciary, um, I would just say that, that the discussions and assessment and evaluations and efforts to strengthen those institutions are things that NGOs do. Um, and you know, it doesn't matter where they are because they impact people. They're, in other words, these are global human rights standards of accountability and transparency that we're trying to protect. Um, if, if that were the case, we wouldn't, y there would be certain countries I would say, well, you can't do anything. A any, you, you, we don't have a discussion about our issues because we're a sovereign nation and we don't have any accountability. And yet, we've also, those countries have also signed either the AU Charter or the, Afri uh, or the, the UN Convention. So, so if we accept that we're part of the global community, then we're part of the global community, both flaws and pluses. And we accept those challenges uh, in, the, in the, the spirit that they're offered, as, not as a political attack, but as a 
let's see how we can do better. And I, I, I really do want to convey that to the Angolan authorities here, that this is a dialogue about how do we help uh, as opposed to how do we, uh, any perception that it, this is meant negatively. Um, I, I think I'll stop there. I just wanted to tie in a couple of things to both the points that you made. I think one of the things that I noticed talking about trends and that some of these issues not being uniquely Angolan um, issues, I look across Southern Africa and I look at um, the way the liberation era political parties that led uh, independence across um, Mozambique, Botswana, uh, even my own country of birth, Zambia, and how they're sort of losing traction with the younger generation. I mean, we've seen for Limo lose um, quite a bit of uh, its support over the years. We've seen Botswana, even in the last elec uh, elections, you know, newer parties gaining uh, a majority of the vote in my own country of birth, Zambia. The United Nations National Independence Party was completely thrown out of office. And this speaks to this managing these generational expectations and how the new um, African leadership across the continent uh, is going to f have to do different, to understand and better manage and speak to the aspirations of this younger generation uh, of, of Africans. I just thought I should uh, put that out there. Uh, any, Can I just, sir, please. Um, one, one thing I'd also like to throw out as, as, as a point of discussion, we, we've talked about the strength of the presidency and its essential role. Um, the question we have to ask is, is this the right model to continue to work through? Should we not be thinking about building institutions that are in strong and independent? In other words, is it a good strategy to rely on an one enlightened pathway forward? I would submit that looking at Africa's history, this is probably something that should seriously be discussed and debated. That is not to question any leadership, whether in Angola or anywhere else, but to basically say that if we don't build institutions that can check or contribute to the discussion of governance outside of the, the ruling party or the executive branch, the, 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 political, the political risks, I think, are quite significant. And I'll end with this, with one interesting anecdote. Um, about, three, about three or four weeks ago, there was a huge story here in the United States about the cost of a, of a washroom facility in Afghanistan that was purchased by the Pentagon. I think the, and the, the figure was over a million dollars. It was basically a million dollars for a WC. It was an outrage. Yeah. And, and yet, this is the, the, it wasn't exposed from the Department of Defense. It was disposed, exposed by another arm of the U.S. government. If governments don't have institutions to watch themselves and to help them be more accountable and transparent, just think of the waste and fraud and corruption and inefficiency that we are left with. If it can happen here, it can happen everywhere. Thank you. I will take two very quick ones. It has to be 30 minutes because we have two, sorry, 30 seconds. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> it has to be 30 seconds um, because then I want to give our speakers about 45 seconds each to just close us off. So I'll take the gentleman here and there was somebody else over there and then we'll close it off. So sir, you have 30 seconds because you're standing between <coughs> all of us and lunch. My name is Aki. Kolawole, legal focus. Uh, if there is no freedom of speech, not enough accommodation of NGOs, and no transparency, how do you expect foreign investors to come to Angola? Okay, that's one comment. I think there was somebody else. Of, sir. Yeah, uh, my name is Nuno Rosa. I'm Mongolian. I have a business development company in Houston. Just to let you know them we're already working on a diversification. So we are capturing investments and business guys to Angola. Uh, specifically question to Mr. Adati. Um, I'm part of a generation that was born in a war, yeah. raised up in a war, and now I am a, a part of the generation is w actively working on development of the country. We were colonized by Portugal 500 years, 40 years uh, independency. We are only since 2002 independence, uh, uh, completely peace, sorry. Uh, based on your experience, uh, and you talked about benchmarking, 
Have you seen any other nation in, in, uh, in Africa involved in this situation that Angola was involved, evolving that much as Angola is evolving? Do you think okay, in the path we are now, we are going back or are we going forward? Thank you. All right, so to be fair to our guests, I'll give him the final word, so I'll start this way now, Aditi. Um, I think as a, my organization doesn't do comparative um, uh, quote-unquote analysis, and so I think um, if I were to give you a personal opinion, it would be just that, so I don't think that that's probably appropriate here. Um, I, 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 I want to stress, we're at, at, this is a discussion about where you are at 40 years. It's not a, um, a, a, a judgment, so to speak. And I think that there, there may be a tendency to see our communications and our comments as, as um, political condemnation. We're talking about trying to help the Angolan government by exposing things that it should think about doing differently. We do the same thing with the United States. We do the same thing with Ghana. We do the same thing with France. Um, because there's a global challenge of human rights that, that and, and the enjoyment of those rights by ordinary people. And history shows us that governments need to be responsive to the people that they govern, or else there's a fundamental lapse in behavior. And that historically is proven. So I, I, I think that at 40 years, we have an opportunity to talk about some of the things both the minister, as well as uh, my colleagues on the, plat the, the panel, have said to think about, um, you know, can we do better? Should we do better? Should we not do better? Um, and most importantly, um, you know, how do we get there? And I think the partnership that Angola is seeking with the United States is going to be a critical factor in that. And the Angolan government should hold the U.S. accountable to its commitments also and to its behavior. Is the U.S. honoring its obligations? There are certainly qu concerns that I could share with you about that. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm deliberately not answering your question, but I'm saying let's, let's think about what we want to get out of this dialogue. There are challenges. There's been progress. Um, but I would just end with this. The context is changing so fast that I, I worry that the Angolan government doesn't have the same amount of time it would have had 10, 15 years ago when the world was a much slower pace. And, 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 dem and, and we are also now seeing that when demands and information are not met or not perceived to, to be met, the consequences now seem to be much more violent and very quick. Okay. And uh, this is a country that knows conflict and the cost of conflict. I'm sure that that's not going to happen, but it would be sad to see that specter be on the rise again. Alex, you have 45 seconds. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. Well, important benchmarks that are coming up are clearly elections in 2017. And um, that there are free and fair elections. The politics in Angola can throw up uh, new uh, configurations, uh, I think is really important. It's a shame that municipal elections keep getting postponed because they are important further building blocks to stability and accountability. And they're clearly not going to happen before 2017. But it's not, I think, in Angola's interest to con for the future stability of the country to constantly delay them. So I would hope that they're on the agenda again after 2017. The biggest single near-term challenge that I see uh, is urban poverty. We already had that question about it. But the peri-urban areas, going into some of the Musekish, it's very depressing. It's a little bit um, alarming um, in terms of talking to people and their complete frustration and disillusionment with politics in Angola. Basically, they see politicians, be they UNITA, CASA, FNLA, MPLA, all not caring about the future. And it's about a grinding survival. And I worry that there are growing numbers of people who feel that there must be alternatives to conventional politics in Angola. That's dangerous, which is why the elections of 17, uh, uh, municipal elections and others are so important. Finally, human rights are really important. They underpin so much. And uh, don't forget that Amnesty International's first <coughs> ever 
prisoner of conscience was a gentleman called Augustinio Neto. So it goes right back to the founding father of Angola and the importance of human rights. Yes, that's right. Mr. Ambassador, you have the final word. Well, let me start by thanking for your comments and your views. In any dialogue, we pay attention to what our interlocutors are saying, uh, especially if uh, these are said with the best intentions to, to help us as a country. <coughs> uh, we became independent because we want to do things our own way, and that's what we are trying to do without being isolated by what is happening around us, around the world. We are interconnected world today, and that's the way we see it also. As a country, we are consolidating peace and national unity because it's important. 13 years that we ended the war is not enough, and more needs to be done to consolidate that. We are also enhancing democracy and rule of law. Today, we have more Angolans trained to deal with the, with the law and the judicial process, so the rights of every citizen can be very well defended. And uh, we see the challenge we face today, like the case of the 15, as part of a growing nation, because today is this case, tomorrow we'll have another case, and every country has a case in the legal system which needs to address, and we'll address it, and let us do it. And uh, at the end, you can have your voice and your views and how we did it. And whatever will be our shortcomings, we'll be open and willing to learn with those with more experience in such a matter. Inclusive development is part of our top priority because we need to have more Angolans being part of the peace dividend. It's a learning process because we don't have much experience in dealing with some of these issues. Alex Vines point out here where at the, by the time of the independence, the country was not ready. The Angolans were not prepared to do so. Then we spent most of our time at the war, preserving uh, the independence, the territorial integrity of the country. Now we are addressing issues of economic development, social issues. That's why we are changing the landscape of the Musekes by investing in new urban development settings to make sure that Angolans have better living conditions. That implies that uh, Angolans need to have the opportunity to, uh, to make money to have good jobs so they can pay for better standards of living. This is a job in progress. That's why we're looking forward to working with US and other international partners to help us to do that. And Angola is one of the countries receiving more foreign investment in the African context because we have a very good uh, environment for that. Every single major oil company is in Angola and uh, expanding the operations, which responds to those who criticize the country, pointing that we are the, one of the most corrupt countries in, in Africa. This is not the case. We understand that there are shortcomings, that there are issues of corruptions. That's why we enacted the, the probity law a few years ago to make sure that we have things on track. Job in progress, keep, keep with us, and we'll see that uh, at the end, will continue to strive to be an example in Africa and how a country can move from a, a worse situation to the one of progress and stability. Thank you very much to all three speakers and um, the, the audience thanked you even before I could ask them to thank you. <laughs> That's always a good sign. So we appreciate your time, your insights, and for sharing so candidly of your positions, your analysis, and your perspectives. And so, okay. So thank you. We appreciate it. And for that effort, I think we'll get to feed you over lunch, <laughs> which uh, to the rest of you uh, for sticking with us. Lunch is now open to everyone. So we're inviting you all to join us for lunch. But before you go, 
Um, I have to say we have uh, Assistant Secretary Linda Thomas-Greenfield who will be speaking at lunch. It is off the record, completely off the record, and I need you all to work with me on this. So if you're coming to lunch, please understand that it is off the record. And in that regard, I'd like to ask our media representatives from both the U.S. and Angola to please stay behind so I can chat with you for a little bit. And I'll ask, I'll ask Maria to please escort our VIPs uh, to lunch. And for the rest of you, it is open seating. So we'll see you in there, and then we'll reconvene back here at 1.30. So thank you so much. We'll get a photo with the panelists.